Uh, I've had the pleasure this afternoon of spending some time with our guests tonight. I, she is clearly a believer in uh, public transit. I think she's probably the only uh, visiting lecturer we've ever had who arrived by bus. Uh, <laughs> Anyone who's working in the field of innovation in transportation, uh, urban transportation today, knows uh, the work of Susan Zielinski. Uh, she's a tremendously inspiring thinker who's not just looking at the kind of uh, in civil engineering infrastructure by which we make our way around in cities. She's looking at, as she quite correctly said, the whole enchilada. What, what does it mean to move in cities? Uh, if you, her, her CV is, uh, recently reads as follows. She's Managing Director of SMART, that is the Sustainable Mobility and Accessibility Research and Transformation. It's a, it's a research center at, uh, well, across university initiative of the University of Michigan. She's co-appointed at UMTRI and the Taubman College of Architecture and Urban Planning. At SMART, she collaborates with partners in communities and regions around the world, including in Michigan, to accelerate implementation of sustainable, integrated, multimodal, equitable, IT-enabled transportation systems to spur the innovation, entrepreneurship, partnerships and industry cluster development to supply those systems. Just before joining SMART, she spent a year as Harvard Loeb Fellow concentrating on new, new mobility innovation. Prior to 2004, she co-founded and directed Moving the Economy, MTE, a City of Toronto-based link tank focused on sustainable transportation innovation and new mobility industry development. Also while at the City of Toronto Planning Department, she worked for over 15 years developing the leading innovative sustainable transportation and livability policies and initiatives starting back in the 90s as Toronto's first bicycle commuter coordinator. She advises on a wide range of local, national and international initiatives and policies related to sustainable transportation, innovation, new mobility industry development and livable cities. And this is a person who has the most connective ideas about connection that I've ever heard of. And so I ask you to welcome Susan Zielinski. Thank you for the beautiful introduction. I, I felt like you know, next was going to come the, the wagon named Rosebud or something, but uh, <laughs> uh, I, I'm really happy to be here. It was such a great, um, it was such a great experience to be around the region and see how beautiful it is and how much change it's gone through and, um, and to be inspired by the combination of sort of economic development and Seoul. So what a great place and how charmed your lives are if you live here and go to school here and work here. Um, and uh, I was just worried because is anyone, has anyone not had dinner? Because we're talking about the whole enchilada. I, it's, I, I realized it was cruel the moment it was that big on the screen. Oh, so sorry, but if you know, you can gently run out and if you want to bring something in and eat, I, I won't mind. So, so yeah, so um, the systems thing is what I like to focus on because it's kind of missing, I'm, it, in, especially in transportation. I think we've got um, sort of four solitudes and um, I think partly because we're so focused on the system itself or on the mode itself and we forget about why we're transporting ourselves. Why are we moving around? It's for the people, right? So it's really not even about transportation or mobility. It's about accessibility. It's about how we meet our needs. So then once you think of it that way, then it brings in so many more aspects to it. So that's why I want to talk about the whole enchilada. 
Um, and I want to give just a little bit of context. Um, right now, I'm from Toronto, as you know, but in Michigan, it's a little bit belly of the beast. Um, and there is a bit of a focus on um, automobility. It's a mobile mindset. It's motor city. Um, and so really what happens is it's a little bit like transportation is cars and everything else is kind of um, other. And um, it reminds me of the word alternative transportation. I don't know if, does anyone use the word alternative transportation? I, I, I have in the past, but I stopped using it because it's, it makes me think that then um, those things that are considered alternative transportation are never going to make it into the mainstream. And it's a little bit like saying women are alternative men. So now I'm thinking more like um, transportation options, transportation systems, so that then the whole system becomes the transportation, your portfolio, as opposed to um, the main thing and all the other stuff. So we all kind of know why we want to have sustainable, equitable transportation from a global. Tonight I'm going to talk from the global perspective, do a little bit about systems and a little bit about the economy stuff. Um, and, but I think you're familiar with um, all of these um, issues and, and what motivates us to have more sustainable transportation systems. Um, my favorite one is urbanization because until uh, we cross that barrier of half the world living in cities and soon three quarters, 80% of the world living in cities. Um, it was still kind of feasible to think, oh, well, as long as everyone drives a Prius, we're fine. But now we have to be so smart about it um, when we think spatially about how the whole world is urbanizing. So that's kind of an exciting thing to make us be smart and make us build on what's there, make us think systems, make us use IT. So, um, and then all this, the, the stuff like climate change, um, which we seem to be experiencing more, um, congestion, growing seniors population, um, and increasing social disparity. That, that's the bad stuff that motivates us. But there's also really amazing other stuff that's happening that, that um, allows us to say, wow, this is really something great and something to look forward to as the next generation of transportation. So this big data thing, this information technology that's really, in a way, the next transportation infrastructure, the information highway is making possible so much optimization and efficiencies and um, seamlessness between a whole range of options. It allows us not to have to actually own a car, but use one sometimes. Um, it allows us information all the time. It, it, it's so much safer. So this whole, um, this whole world of information, which is pretty important here in this region, um, has, I think, revolutionized transportation. And then there's other great stuff, which is the millennial generation, the 18 to 35-year-olds who are saying, you know what? Actually, I don't derive my sense of self or ego by my Ford Mustang. That, it used to be that in, in our day. You know, when we were 16, I think I got my license the day after I was 16. And now this big shift in preferences and desires of the younger generation, not just in North America and the UK, but now it's starting to happen globally as well. So these are the great things that are happening that are motivating us. So what I want to start with is some images. Um, in, in response to both the bad stuff and the great stuff, there are so many innovations going on all around the world. And the other exciting part is it's not just in the Western world. It's, it's in the developed world, the developing world, the emerging economies. And it's not just infrastructure. It's not just the old way of thinking about transportation as big, heavy sort of roads and systems and concrete stuff, bricks and mortar. It's a, such a range of services and products and designs and technologies and infrastructures. So um, I want to just start with some images from uh, a global prize that we started called Moby Prize. And it's basically for entrepreneurial 
enterprises in new mobility. Um, so I'll just run through them. This is oh, the first one is the winner um, uh, from China who has a connected system between buses, bike share, car share, and a whole IT system for integrated fare payment and wayfinding, um, mobile way, wayfinding. Uh, this is a, a, in Brazil, a, a really interesting carpooling program that um, uh, has taken off and uh, deals with safety issues um, around making sure that people didn't, don't feel that they're going to be sharing a car with an axe murderer. Um, and um, this is uh, Zambikes, um, wonderful um, company that sells bamboo bikes and makes um, non-motorized options for um, people for all sorts of different, you know, like the, uh, an ambulance bike, but also um, sells the bikes in um, North America. So a whole range and trains people. So it's this really rich uh, combination of enterprise and, um, and utility and uh, transportation sustainability. Rotify in the US, US which is um, uh, online um, integrated um, information on um, many modes of transportation. Eco cabs, a, a really great way of um, bringing in, you know, uh, f being able to phone a rickshaw instead of having to flag one. Um, all sorts of new things with guided uh, guideways, um, car shares and peer to peer car shares as well. Um, uh, electric uh, bikes, uh, electric little vehicles, different sizes, um, green cabs, um, more car sharing, um, uh, more car sharing, um, interesting ways of doing goods movement with non-motorized um, commute optimization, um, job creation, urban farming, which is actually something I consider transportation because it means not moving. When we talk about transportation, we can talk about moving people and we can talk about moving stuff, but we can also talk about not moving. So either by avoiding trips or making them shorter, you know, urban production, urban design and um, local production and distribution. And of course, you know, telework, teleshop and all that stuff um, are ways to not move. Um, Taxi platforms for security and for uh, better access, and everybody's heard of Uber as well. Relay rides, peer-to-peer -peer using your own car to be uh, also a shared car um, system, be part of a shared car system. Really interesting bike share uh, systems where um, the iPhone is on the bike so that you don't have to have the parking infrastructure like in, like in the Bixie. Um, a ton of apps, uh, one of which wakes you up when the train's really going to arrive as opposed to when it actually does, uh, as opposed to when it was supposed to. Um, uh, all sorts of bike share, um, mobility management, multimodal mobility management, um, more bamboo bikes, uh, slugging, um, auto rickshaws, really um, exciting uh, last mile solutions. Bicycle schools, getting it into the culture, electric vehicle taxis, uh, electric bikes, um, digital media mapping, so people can actually affect. I'm sorry, they can actually affect their um, uh, their own situations by um, mapping their own communities and um, changing the transportation situation. And then really great products um, to make biking more of a normal um, activity that you can do without having to wear special clothes. Um, uh, all sorts of different software solutions, electric skateboards, I mean, it goes on. These are all um, applications, submissions to the, the um, Mobi Prize that we had. And I'm just gonna show you the little video Mobi Prize. Mobi Prize. International Award. New Mobility Entrepreneurs. Innovators from around the globe.
making a real difference in the world. Transforming transportation. More sustainable. More elegant. More awesome. Who will win this year's prize? Maybe it's you. So the Moby Prize uh, was started with the help of the, the Rockefeller Foundation in 2012, and we were able to present it at Rio Plus 20. Um, and uh, then last year we presented it at the um, OECD um, International Transport Forum, and this coming year we're presenting it in Detroit in September um, for uh, the at the ITS World Congress, where um, 10,000 people are coming to Detroit for a world gathering of people who are applying IT to transportation. And this year there's a special new mobility section of that, uh, comp of that um, conference and the Moby Prize will be part of that whole um, uh, event. So, so the whole thing I'm getting at is that it used to be that um, it was walking and nothing else. And then there was a bunch of stuff and it became, there's driving and, and nothing else uh, in a lot of the world. But now transportation is getting more flat. Friedman would say transportation is flat. And so what we have instead of um, sort of a vehicular system, we have um, an open source, multimodal, multi-service, IT enhanced, user focused, socially equitable, aesthetic, livable, whole systems, transportation system, which basically means more choices, um, more connected. And the really great thing is that um, it's not just the individual um, innovations, but it's the system innovations that are also um, an opportunity to transform the economy that's going to support the supply of a next more sustainable um, transportation system. And the exciting part is that it brings in so many new uh, industries that aren't uh, related to the usual um, tra transportation industry. So yes, it's manufacturing, but it's also IT, it's real estate, um, it's energy, utilities, telematics, um, logistics, um, a whole range of these um, innovations that I started out with. Um, so then, if we think about the seamlessness, we saw all the innovations, but then how does it come together? In some places that we've been, it seems to come together quite well, but nowhere is it perfectly seamless. And um, there's, uh, Veolia um, has developed a video that, I'll just start it while, while I talk. This is a visualization that brings together mainly things that already exist and says, what's the day in the life going to be of seamless transportation? And this is pretty much like our day of information technology. I mean, if you think printer, camera, desktop, laptop, iPhone, Google, all of these things we have, we customize and they're interoperable and they're seamless. And we choose which products and they all connect to each other. That's the way that transportation is evolving. So you have collaborative use vehicles, you have IT. You have working at home, gaming. And imagine also all of the um, innovation and economic development opportunities that come out of this. It then, it then kind of moves from the old kind of paradigm of public transit is a public cost and highways are an investment. Well, this is, ah, actually the big economic direction we need to go in and are going in is new mobility. Some early studies have shown that it's a multi-billion dollar industry. 
and growing. And sometimes we get comments that, well, you know, what about places where people don't have a mobile phone? But that's changing now because now even in um, countries where it, they're, they're really economically challenged, most people do have mobile phones before they even have indoor plumbing. And um, even if they don't, the IT systems can uh, be um, still helping the transportation systems by having kiosks in town and a whole range of, of IT support. So um, it's not so far-fetched anymore um, to have IT more integrated within the transportation system. And in the new mobility world, you have to learn how to do that. It's, a, it's an anti-obesity thing. So yeah, and, and what, I, what I started to realize is that when you think about connectivity, you might think about it in a certain way. I mean, I think about connectivity as IT connectivity, but also physical connectivity, but it could also be service connectivity, uh, institutional. If you think about all the people that have to be in charge of all the different components and how they have to end up talking to each other, then you have a really interesting um, challenge in terms of making sure that it, it is seamless. Um, cultural and psychological connectivity and, and economic, of course. Um, so that's the kind of direction it's moving in. But then if you start to think, but how do we make that happen? What's the reality of the how? Um, and one of the things that we came up against when we um, began to think about how we implement whole systems instead of just individual parts of it um, separately was that you, you realize um, there are different, um, it's, like, it's like four solitudes. And uh, you've got people um, who are in the traditional sort of highway transportation infrastructure side um, and um, you have people that are in the technology side, and then you have designers and urban planners, and then you have the zip car people and the shared bike people, um, and then you have the transit people. But seldom do they talk to each other um, or come together to integrate the system. Uh, especially um, the public and the private. Um, there are public-private partnerships, but they seem to happen really late in the process, as opposed to in the um, ideation phase. So um, when you think about this, it's, it's all about the different, um, the different movers of it. It's not about the user. And if you're thinking about the user, all of those things have to come together. And then to add to that, the, to add to the complexity of it all, um, again, it's, it's not just moving people, but it's moving goods and moving less. So um, if you want to actually get those people together and have them um, accomplish something, um, you have to get over something. I don't know if anyone, has anyone here had a conversation about transportation that's been frustrating? How about a meeting that has been frustrating about transportation? Yeah, see, so this is, this. Okay, this came to me one day, I thought, you know, all the meetings are like this. They're, they're two hours long, and you uh, start with, um, you, you know, you go for most of the meeting with what's wrong, like all the problems. And then at the end, you, somebody says, oh, we were supposed to actually come up with solutions. And then people go, oh. So then it's this big laundry list and you get 30 things. And then someone says, oh, I'm the voice of reason, we're gonna prioritize. And, but really, in a system, prioritizing is the exact opposite of what we need to be doing. We actually need to be doing all the stuff, and it needs to connect to each other. So um, it's a little bit like if God were to say, 
do you want a heart or a lung or a pituitary gland? Uh, and, you know, I'd say I, I kind of want all of them, and I want them to fit together really nicely and seamlessly. So that's where we have to figure out how to do things better and how to develop holograms of the system as opposed to serially doing one thing at a time, including the urban design in which this has to happen. So um, that's, when, that's when the smart thing comes in. Um, when, when I went down to Michigan, um, we were um, lucky enough to be working with Ford Motor Company because they were um, looking at how they could think differently about the future. And um, they wanted to think about systems and they wanted to think of themselves as more than a car company, but as a sort of like a transportation company. Um, so they made it possible for us to um, say yes to invitations um, to India and then South Africa and then Brazil to work and collaborate and listen to what some of the challenges are and then to develop a sort of a methodology for moving systems forward. Um, there are lots of different organizations that brilliantly help um, cities and communities put in a BRT and there are consultants who do that really well and there, there are um, consultants and, and NGOs that help with urban design or with the technology but um, there's a huge gap in how to implement the whole system. So um, we thought we were going to just work in India and because we got this great invitation to work with the people who were developing the new urban policy for India. Um, this was back in 2006, 2007. And, um, and with, um, with the CEOs of most of the major IT company, the outsourcing IT companies, and, they, and the, the business sector was really thinking hard about transportation because they had built all these campuses in, in this sort of emerging economy Thing that all these campuses were outside of the cities and the transportation was becoming a big net mess and they all wanted flyovers and so they needed some solutions and, and uh, they also were afraid to have buses because they didn't want um, their, the different um, employees to be in the same buses and tell each other secrets. There were all these really interesting challenges they had but they, and they had too many modes in a sense. They had, you know, everything possible on the streets and very little planning. And uh, so it was kind of an interesting place to start. Um, so we um, listened a lot, we talked a lot, um, and we also thought about um, an approach that was being taken in, in Germany um, which was called Mobilpunkt. It was, uh, it was a way to connect different modes at points in the city, almost like urban acupuncture points, like Jamie Lerner from Curitiba, who, who started the, Cur the first Curitiba um, bus rapid transit system. Um, um, Michael Gloss Richter did this with many points across the city that uh, where you could get off the bus but get into a taxi, get out of the train, get onto a bicycle. So really interesting, and it was very much public sector to start. Um, but then, you know, in India, there's not a lot of public sector transportation, at least at that time especially. Um, so there was openness to say, how can we leapfrog? How can we apply technologies? How can we put in some of these approaches? So um, that was going on in India. Then we were invited to South Africa because South Africa had this um, big soccer tournament coming up um, called the World Cup. And they really wanted to do some things and they really needed to do some things to make the transportation system better. Um, and then, um, it began to, we started to see patterns. We started to learn that, um, you know, Toronto's not the only place where the important people in transportation haven't met each other yet sometimes, or where there's a non-integration um, challenge. Um, and so we were seeing this over and over again, where uh, even just arriving in the city, um, and then saying, can we talk to entrepreneurs in this area? Can we talk to 
the public sector people, but beyond the usual suspects. So yes, the planning people, but also the IT people, the um, social services, the economic development, um, a whole range of um, you know uh, energy and environment, and then the NGOs, um, and also the big companies. And uh, because we were working with Ford, um, that was interesting because Ford was exploring how to expand what they were doing. Their presence actually piqued the interest of other industries that said, ah, oh, yeah, that's right, there is a really huge opportunity here to be shifting what we supply. How can we rethink? You know, so we've got Cisco Systems and IBM and Siemens and all of these companies that are trying to actually create the different products. So um, basically what happened was all of these learnings fell into um, a four-step program. And it was four-step because 12-step um, could have been interesting, but um, you know, attention deficit disorder. So um, what happened was um, we realized that it's not actually rocket science to put a system in place once you get it, once you get, oh yeah, right, all these things have to connect with each other. Here I am, I'm, I'm working at the transit system and all I'm thinking about is where they get on and where they get off and everything in between, but then after they get off, it's not my job. And everybody's like that, not because they're bad, but because that's just the way it is and there's no one actually that's supposed to be bringing it all together. So um, what happened was when, when we would arrive, we would talk to a few people and then build out the conversation a little bit wider and uh, we would start the conversation instead of, uh, so obviously beyond the usual suspects, but also um, a little bit radically uh, by saying not what's wrong, but what do you love about what exists? What's really amazing? And so we did this in Detroit and people were really shocked and they, they were actually silenced because they were so used to actually complaining about how bad it was. And um, then when we ran around the table, it was 30 of the, the leaders of transportation in, in the Detroit, Southeast Michigan. And um, at the end, they all said, you know, I had never knew so many great things actually were happening here in this region. And so we began to do that all the time because then you start to see, oh, well, actually you start building on what's there instead of thinking you've got to start everything fresh or that nothing's there. And so taking an inventory. So, that's, so that was step one. And then step two was, okay, well, we need to map this out because we need to see what's already there and what we don't have to actually reinvent. And once we did that, it was an absolutely magical thing because, well, the first time we did it in the U.S. was in Washington, D.C. And um, a colleague of mine, a friend of mine, um, is... Um, was director of planning for, for Washington, D.C., and she said, you know, we want to do this, uh, this kind of integrated thing that you're doing. You know, how come you're doing it in South Africa and India? We want it here, too, in the U.S. And so um, I said, well, you know, D.C. is doing pretty well. And she said, yeah, but it's not seamless. So I said, well, you know what we really need to do? We need to um, make this map and overlay everything, put in the... Um, the bus routes, all of the zip car stands, all of the taxi stands, all of the parking lots, um, every mode of transportation, and you know airports, um, everything. And then wherever two or more things already connect, you put a red dot. And that was just to say, okay, where's the grid? But when that happened, it was unbelievable because people that had been working on this for years, they themselves are suddenly seeing, oh my goodness, we have a really rich integrated system already. The users might not know that. If we don't know that, the users certainly don't know that they can go from here to here to here really seamlessly because even in terms of people finding out how, what the bus routes are, they're not connected to the other things. 
So, you know, in, in D.C., the, the, the very first thing was the, the, the head of transit said, I had no idea so many of my bus stops already connected to zip cars. And um, then the director of IT um, for the city said, you know, we've got the IT for the public systems, but we could also link them interoperably with the things like the taxis and the, and the zip cars. And so all of these discoveries happen. And so we began to do that, not only as an inventory, but as a realization, and then be, and it, it began to generate conversation. So it became like a charrette. So now uh, we've done this in um, India, South Africa, Brazil, the Philippines, China. We, we recently did um, uh, a 60 person um, uh, all day charrette um, with the leads um, of, of the Beijing, the municipality of Beijing, um, brought together by the Beijing Planning Commission. And it was, it was spectacular, the, the um, uh, level of uh, understanding and ideas that come out. So then out of that, what happens is that you realize, oh, um, we could do some things right away. And one of the things we discovered, all of these things we discovered after we started doing it, it wasn't, we didn't think of it in advance. So for example, in this world, um, I'm just, uh, can you think of a city that has a combination of great leadership, really good land use, and really good policy for transportation? All of those things are the same. Can anyone think of one city that has that? New York City. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Any others? Portland. Yep. Any others? Any others? Okay, so how many cities are there in the world? Well, anyway, we don't have to. <laughs> Maybe that's for later when, when you've eaten. But, um, you know, we've got to be thinking about how to do stuff. Where, oh, and infrastructure is the other thing. Um, uh, there's, there's a wonderful mayor of Bogota, uh, and his brother, who, who lives in Mississauga and does incredible stuff. And, and they're very much about you have to have a strong mayor and you have to have great infrastructure. And that really is fantastic if you have that. But in so many places, you don't. So then how do you start thinking of things that can be done without that? So what happens in these sessions is that people say, ah, oh, okay, well, um, we don't have, uh, we, can't, we can't do anything with transit. We can't even talk to the public sector folks. Um, so, but we can actually develop these smaller vans and we can make sure that they come to a connection point and they connect to the auto rickshaws, etc. cetera. Um, and, you know, for example, in South Africa, we were looking at, in Cape Town, we were looking at combinations of different modes and services and um, the, some of the private sector people were saying, well, you know, those people at the city won't tell us where they're going to put the stops, and it's, you know, we have to wait for them. And then the, the um, owner of a chain of grocery stores said, well, wait a minute, you know, I have grocery stores across the city. In front of every grocery store is a bus stop. We could put at those bus stops, we could take some of our parking space, we could put cabs, we could put bike share, we could put car share, and then you have this network. So this is a really flexible way, and then it can be on demand, and then you can start to have all sorts of things that are helped in terms of you know, online supports. So also in Cape Town, um, they realized that all of the different systems were on different uh, websites. And that's such a simple, not rocket science thing. But if you put it all in one place, somebody can actually plan their trip. So all of these things started to evolve out of this. And you have this opportunity to create instant solutions. Oh, well, we could just move that zip car across the road and then it's completely seamless. Um, we can do that next week. Or, wow, there's a development gap here. and everyone's going to be moving there, there's no transportation, maybe we do need a BRT right there. 
Um, or, you know, that would be dumb here because I think we're putting a BRT over top of the subway, which may be slightly redundant. Things like that are amazing. And you've, you've all been at charrettes, you know these things happen. But these things hardly ever happen in transportation. They happen in sort of more general urban design. So this, we've been watching this over and over transform the way people think about it from single mode to whole system and actually sparking all sorts of on-the-ground um, uh, multimodal system solutions. In Cochin, it was very exciting because they had heard what was happening in Chennai, in India, and Cochin is the other side of India, around the same level in the south, and um, they took a primer. We have a primer that outlines this whole process because we want people to learn it. We're not, um, you know, we're not like consultants. We're not trying to be there all the time. And I'm flying around all the time leading these things. We're trying to train people how to do this because it's just general principles. It's not, um, it's not something, it has to be customized to each region. But somebody um, heard about it and said, we need that in Cochin. They wrote a report, and what was going to be just a little tiny bus station to help with the traffic in this new developing place, they said, let's make a multimodal center. So within, um, oh, and let's get 40 acres of agricultural ministry land and put it there. And oh, by the way, let's bring the ferry boats across again instead of having people driving all the way around. Oh, and by the way, why don't we bring the new subway stop to that? So suddenly it became this incredible multimodal center that brought the whole idea of integrated transportation to Cochin in a way that they didn't even expect. And the interesting development there was that because it was in one place and uh, because then they were talking about, oh, now they have several million dollars to be doing a much bigger uh, center, which causes traffic problems because they didn't actually analyze the entire region. So now, now they're beginning to go across the entire region and say, oh, we want points like that everywhere. We want connection points as a grid or a mesh, not central points, it's distributed. So um, th that kind of thing can happen when people um, take this approach. So, um, and then the last thing, you know, there's the piloting of these different projects. And it doesn't have to be that everybody agrees on one project either, because this approach allows people to say, okay, in this neighborhood or right in that spot, we can, these two players can fix it and, and address that. Um, so what we also started to do, because um, there's no one expert here, and people are always coming up with great ideas. We have a network of the people who have done this process, so the 22 different um, leads of these processes. The other thing that was really interesting, speaking of checkered pasts and, and qualifications, um, the people who are really doing amazing things are hardly ever transportation planners or architects or urban planners. They're actually amazing partnership builders. They're not technical folks, but they know what needs to happen. They know how things need to connect together. They know who to get involved. So it's a really interesting sort of a shift in leadership um, of the transformation. So, um, this is some, just some images of the convening in different parts of the world. Um, that's uh, Rio. I can't actually see it from this angle, but oh, and that's, yeah, that's Bangalore, and that's Detroit. Um, and then this is Lansing, that's Ann Arbor. Oh, you can see here, um, it's really, we try and do it um, um, area by area. It's kind of like a 20, 10 to 20 mile uh, kilometer area. And you begin to see the real granularity of, you know, um, bike share, parking lot, all those things. And then we inset them within the region so that you can have a whole regional view of how all these connective systems link to each other.
Manila was interesting. Um, we did a couple of day session and um, we give out certificates from the University of Michigan saying, you have done this, you know how to do this now. Somebody took that and said, she's with Clean Air Asia, she's a lawyer with Clean Air Asia, and she said, I want to do this in this other part of, of Manila. Um, and uh, she got the Asian Development Bank involved. And so they did that in the next place. And out of that, it happened in another place where they were trying to assess how to do a bike share program. And so it's not like, where do we put the bike share stops? It's how do we place them within the existing system, which is a really different thing, because so often then you have things that aren't just uh, jiving. Um, there's Rio. There's Cochin. This is what they built. Within a year of deciding to do it, they built this kind of mini Frank Gehry thing. Um, and that's the thing they're going to tear down in order to build the big lead standard thing. Uh, it was phenomenal how quickly it all happened. And Oh, and, and um, the other thing that's really neat about it is that if you think about policy, I've been finding that in the U.S. it's a little bit more policy-oriented than it is even in Canada, that, that really policy is the way that you change transportation. And in India, you just can't think that way, because if you did, you would never do, get anything done. And so now, many of the things that are initiatives by private sector are inspiring public sector change and then policy change. So this happened in both Chennai and Cochin, that the shovels went into the ground, these things went up, and the ministers and the mayors all came to them and said, ah, okay, so how can we help this? How can we change policy? And it's really beginning to develop in that way. Um, that's Chennai. They did a lot of, they did some radical stuff about making sidewalks. <laughs> and, um, you know, when you've got a lot of dug up sidewalks and oxen and informal um, uh, economy, this mix, um, they were able to do some demonstration um, uh, walkability areas and they even put in a bike lane in an upscale neighborhood right next to the train. Um, and so these, these are sort of demonstrations of connectivity or holograms of connectivity so that, um, to create a demand. Uh, Mexico City, um, one night I was on Skype and I'd already been having these strange people calling me on Skype out of the blue, so I'd, I'd blocked. And um, so I get this call from someone named Florencia and it's 11 o'clock at night and I'm thinking, oh, another stalker. I'm thinking, you know what? A stalker would not be called Florencia. So I answered it and, um, and she said, you know, I've just read your article on this integrated mobility and I really want to do this in Mexico City. Um, she said, you know, I used to run the uh, transit system in Mexico City, which would be kind of a big job. And she said, I felt like um, the transit system was great and the taxis are amazing, but there's nothing, there's nothing for people to do once they get out of the transit system. So I want this to be more integrated. What I've been doing, she, with the help of um, Carlos Slim, um, they were able to do these gateway multimodal centers outside the city where you leave your car and then you get into the system. But now their next step in Mexico City is to do this in a more granular way, similar to our, so our two systems uh, linked, and that's what they're working on now. Um, I already told you a little bit about Cape Town, and I'll just go through quickly. Um, and in Los Angeles, um, there's been an ongoing effort to um, do uh, a demonstration of um, hub networks or new mobility grids, and they also have been working to engage some of the Hollywood stars to be um, champions of this, to be cue givers, because, you know, why not in Hollywood change the culture? Um, so that's where we come into moving minds. Um, a friend of mine once said, um, isn't that amazing how much Philip K. Dick predicted? And um, it really, it, it 
struck me that actually I wonder if he predicted it or if he created it and shaped it. If those, if those thoughts and those books, and what he was thinking, actually became the outcomes. And then what does that mean for what we're thinking and what we're creating? And are we creating really rich, robust, humane, um, um, chaotic, um, yet connected systems and organic systems, um, beautiful systems? Or are we creating one system fits all. So that thing about moving minds is, I think, one of the key things. So I'm just going to finish off with um, the surprising things we found by just trying to figure out a way to implement systems as systems. And so um, we knew that we wanted it to connect everything, but um, we didn't realize that a uh, systems approach can almost mean all yeses because transportation is a very no, this versus that kind of a thing. But if you think in systems, you can in many ways not, you can't do everything, but you can do a lot more stuff if you're, if you're optimizing. So it's a more of a yes-oriented thing. Um, and it's for all shapes and sizes. At first we thought that we were trying to deal with the megacities, but actually this also applies to rural. It also applies especially to suburbs and exurbs because you have all these really amazing um, opportunities to use IT, for example, to develop on-demand kind of small shuttles, um, things that can serve the suburbs before the actual public systems get in. Um, you can go ahead and do them um, in a public-private way um, yeah, in advance. And so that, that was a real big discovery because I come from, I, I, I'm from Scarborough and you know, growing up in Scarborough made me a real urban person. And uh, I just feel like it's the suburbs we have to um, um, improve. And when I look here, I just think, oh my goodness, not that it was a suburb, but it was a combination of places with, with space in between and how it's been developed is brilliant. And so there's a lot that you can do now more and more with shared use, information technology, combined with sort of public-private innovation and more public attention onto this kind of shared responsibility for transportation. Um, and then um, it's sexy. Um, that's, that's one of the really neat things. Transportation can be really boring if you think of it as the old kind of infrastructure stuff. But um, if you think of it as, you know, it, you've got so many more choices and, um, you know, owning your own car is so last millennium. Um, you can, you know, with, with things like shared vehicles, um, if in the, during the week you can um, pick up your um, electric van and take the kids to soccer and then you can have your hot date in the natural gas Maserati or something um, on the weekend. So way more opportunities and way less responsibility and um, also feel good about it. So. Um, and then the resilient and robust thing was really also a surprise. Um, we hadn't thought of it this way, but if you, if you imagine a system uh, has more redundancy. Uh, so in other words, if you have more choices, more connected, and you have like a Katrina, or if you have a terrorism, an act of terrorism, uh, and people have to survive and get around, you have many more choices, you have, you know, bikes in everybody's garages, you don't have single points of failure like one bridge where everybody's trying to get out. We can transform the transportation economy, the economy of cities, um, by really trying to find these perhaps open platforms that allow local entrepreneurs to connect with some of the um, you know, multinational companies that are also providing platforms and also um, new services that people can provide locally and, and that can be scaled and replicated and that serve not just the, um, the up-and-coming 
but um, serve the urban poor as well. Um, so I'm going to finish with, I've just been thinking about this region a little bit, and um, there's a huge opportunity here for you know, a state-of-the-art new mobility grid, like the most robust new mobility grid, and connecting the different areas. It would be really exciting to see, and it's already happening. Um, and I think there has been, you know, a fair bit of charrette work here. Um, and so, just to me, that's, you know, really close. It's really possible. Um, industry cluster, that might be something that maybe not everyone thought about in relation to transportation, but given the IT brilliance and energy here, why not have hackathons around new mobility for the region, but also that can be for export? Um, and, uh, you know, everything, integrated wayfinding, fare payment, revenue generation, traffic, um, traffic management, whole range of stuff. And then, you know, the brilliant academic institutions, how can they serve um, the future of transportation in the region and, and the region in general? So that's it. Thank you, Susan. And I, part of the format of these things has always been a, a, a sort of a, a response to what we've heard. And I, I rather than uh, pretending to offer any response, I was just going to sort of lead off uh, with a question. And, and it, it is about uh, the whole issue of design in relation to what you're saying. Um, because, you know, we are uh, at home in general with uh, uh, the, our approach to design of some sort of comprehensive system, whether it's a tiny thing like a spoon or a massive thing like a city or a region. And I'd just like to ask you to, to talk for a few minutes about the whole idea of what design is and does in the kind of multi-layered uh, systems approach. I mean, you're saying it's so clear that you could come to a municipality that has no capacity to build a rapid transit system in the traditional sense. The, cost of that of high scale infrastructure is so great. So, but just can you talk about design a little bit and how design works in the kind of systems approach that, that you're advocating here? Um, I love that question because we've had actually a fair few meetings around design and, um, and its role, and its changing role, in a way. And, and so then you get into a meeting, and then you realize everybody has a different definition of what design is. So, you know, the car guys think that design is car design. And then, um, you know, there's urban design, and then the technology people, there's system design, there's community design, which is a whole range of stuff. And the part that um, kind of, um, took me aback in the process of this work in the different cities was feeling like the master plan is one of those things that you really want to have on one hand. But on another hand, if you have more people being part of the design process. So we've, we've actually done the, the mapping process with citizens. Um, in Sao Paulo, we did it with um, 70 um, citizens in a very low-income community, and it was brilliant. I mean, the stuff that they came up with was incredible. And so what is the sweet spot or the balance between um, the kind of design that you need in order for it to really work, but also the nimbleness and flexibility. So maybe a master plan sometimes doesn't allow for the rate of change of technology 
So then you get, you've got policy challenges because you've got, you know, Uber coming in. You've got all these different things that say, well, this is a different way of doing it. Or you want to make the streets different sizes. There's, there, there, there needs to be some deep thinking about this because design, it, it, this cannot happen without design. But design needs to be, needs to make more space for the kinds of complexities and changes we're going through. And it also needs to invite more people into it and including people from the information technology that might come up with stuff that could really help the design of a place. So um, the other, that kind of also relates to policy because one of the things in transportation specifically, not so much in urban design, but transportation, it, it just really, it's either um, the, the automotive folks that think about cafe standards and then in, I'm just really simplifying, but basically in, in sort of transit and urban, it's the transit folks. But really, um, transportation policy relates to everything, social services, information technology, innovation, economic development, housing, hugely. But those things are hardly ever brought to the transportation discussion, which is why you end up having a disconnect. So how do you end up having the, the reconnection of design with all of these aspects as opposed to the siloing? So that's a really long and fairly unfocused answer, but those things are so, so important. And, 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 and having to involve more people in both the policy making and the design, I guess. I used to want everybody to want sustainable transportation for the same reasons I did, because it's good for the environment, because it's great for, for all people and not just the rich. And I realize now that there are many gateways. And so sometimes the culture comes out of the action, and sometimes the action comes out of the culture. So, I think how do you create it in some ways, sometimes in some cities, you put it on the ground first and then they want it. So for example, in Denver, um, everyone protested against this little three mile LRT. They said, no way, we think this is such a dumb idea. And we just, you're never gonna get us out of our cars. And now uh, they got it and then they asked for more and they asked for more and now Denver is one of the real leading kind of spread out kinds of places. And then, you know, there are other places where you've got a culture, but it, it somehow isn't gelling. Like parts of, parts of Toronto transportation culture, the, the seamlessness isn't there. Even though there's a culture of bicycling and there's a culture of transit, it doesn't kind of come together sometimes. So uh, how do you do it? I don't know. I think trying to, in, in a way, it's, it's maybe you find the places where you can move things forward. And it might be the culture, or it might be that you can work with some industry to do some stuff, or you can work with some planners to do a demonstration to show people how it feels. Or, and, or, all of these things are and, or, because my sense is you have to do everything. But, you know, our education system really needs to have more involvement in education by more than just the kind of planner types needs to be across the board. How are we involved with our cities? Can I just ask a question about the po apparently polar opposites that have to coexist in your vision of the world? And, and you know, you've been very uh, eloquent in supporting new systems, IT related systems, very um, uh, distributed systems, low tech systems, in a world where, you know, we're talking about investing almost a billion dollars in an LRT system in this region. Uh, Toronto is investing multi-billion dollars in a system. Is, it, is, does one way of thinking in any sense preclude the other? Or what is the way in which these two apparent polarities uh, best work together? 
I mean, should we be, I mean, there's an a, a op-ed piece in the local newspaper, the record, the other day saying, well, we shouldn't spend $818 million on LRT. Most people say that because they don't believe, like in Denver, that people are going to get out of their cars. On the other hand, this argued that this is stupid because in 10 years we'll have driverless cars, we'll have IT enabled everything, and this is a waste of money. So that's the kind of opposition that I'd just like to ask you to respond to. Yeah, I've, I've rocked back and forth catatonically about that a fair bit. I think the more we have true dialogue, the more we find out that the people that are designing the self-driving vehicles, for example, are doing it some of them are doing it because of safety. You know, they're doing, they're, they're, all the motivations behind this, sometimes they're similar motivations, just different manifestations. So how do we increase the level of, of creative thought and civic involvement? How do we develop a, a culture of dialogue? And we have so many more tools for doing that. And we have so many more tools for understanding what the great examples are of doing this. So that's all, that's all I've been able to come up with. Uh, what role will you see uh, for uh, your mobility grid, as you call it, and the rejuvenation, the future rejuvenation of Detroit? Mm -hmm. um, every time I'm there, those uh, arterial roads radiating in and out of the downtown mm -hmm. have very few cars or vehicles on them. There are no pedestrians anywhere most of the time. Mm -hmm. And uh, the people mover um, doesn't have any people on it. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'm really interested in your thoughts, and I'm fascinated mm -hmm. by what's uh, happening in that city right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right now, mm -hmm. it's more exciting than it's ever been. It's so incredible. When I first got there in 2006, people were completely depressed. Um, you know, the mayor was going to jail. <laughs> the, um, now there's a, a governor, there's a Republican governor who believes in cities, who's an innovator. So there's a kind of a power center around let's build our cities, let's let's create it was the republican governor that created the regional transportation authority which which didn't exist and i think there's a there's a region around here that we know about that didn't have a regional authority for a while so you know I, and i left toronto and got to there and thought no this can't be can't be true but the really neat thing that's happening is that um yeah it's this auto culture um belly of the beast, some of which are really rethinking, like the Fords of the world, which sparked the BMWs of the world, which sparked the Chryslers of the world, thinking that way. And then you've got this incredible um, maker culture. This, this, uh, there's the whole entrepreneurial um, young energy in Detroit because there's a little ant line that comes from Brooklyn and, and right to Detroit, uh, young people buying up um, buildings to make into factories to do really cool things. Um, a student of mine came to me and said, Sue, I'm using my urban planning degree. You'll be so proud. And I said, what, what are you doing? He said, I started um, um, a, a, a bagel, a, um, what do you call it, an art artisanal bagel shop at the market <laughs> and so he's actually part of this kind of downtown redevelopment and piece by piece they're doing parts of of detroit and making it feel absolutely beautiful and they're the bones of detroit i mean it was it was the art deco was the design era and and there's design in the dna of people in detroit so it's really strange but i think it has a huge possibility to leapfrog because of all of these different energies. And they're actually starting to come together. Um, so, I mean, I don't mean to overstate the case because, you know, there's still a bankruptcy uh, thing going on. I mean, it's declared, Detroit's declared bankruptcy. Some people are seeing that in some ways as a, as a not a bad thing, like a can, like clean slate. But um, the Kresge Foundation, some, something really innovative that they've done is that the Kresge Foundation has supported, has joined together with, I think, 10 major um, companies 
to put in this M1 down Woodward. And they've begun to redesign the street and it's just got, um, you know, it's just moved from the planning stage and it's gonna be implemented this year really fast. I think you're gonna see Detroit be completely different within the next couple of years. And um, we just got a Whole Foods. There used to be no grocery stores in Detroit, not even a grocery store. There were like 7-Elevens. And now there's a Whole Foods. I mean, it's just, it's, it's, see, this is what makes me feel hopeful, that you think these places are never going to get out of the auto mentality, and then it just almost goes the other way. They're, they're, they're putting a BRT, they, there's a new BRT coming in, and there's Woodward, there's, there's a, a light rail line like, like in Denver. And that's been talked about. Um, I knew about it, I knew about it secretly when I got there in 2006. And then, you know, it's been talk, 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 and everyone was so worn out from just thinking it's going to happen and it's not. And then now it's finally reached the point where it's been approved and all of the, you know, all the approvals have gone through and implementation has started. And so, yeah, so there's BRT line, there's a, um, a cycling plan, there's a bike share program starting there. Um, there's, a, there's Detroit Bus Company, which is a private bus company that's serving areas that are not served. Um, there are all these different kind of um, apps that are coming up and new little services. It, it's really kind of experimental right now. It's a great, in fact, it's a great place to be if anyone wants to, <laughs> wants to consider, you know, spending some time there. It's really actually kind of cool. I wouldn't have said this two years ago, actually. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little more about bicycles in the city. You mentioned earlier that bicycles didn't used to be seen as sort of transportation device, but something more as leisure. Um, and maybe like how did that cultural change come about, for example, like in Toronto and the sort of maybe like lukewarm bike culture in Toronto right now and how we can push that forward, how you think we can push that forward? <laughs> Um, well, so this is, this, okay, this is, <laughs> this, this was my job, right? <laughs> like, this was, so, so, so I'm, I'm trying to figure out how to make it not a long answer. Um, but, but, um, I think what happened was, um, in Toronto, um, was it, first of all, the reason why, um, the city cycling committee was formed was because they, they tried to legislate bicycles off the road in Toronto because it was considered a, a recreational thing and there was this whole move towards you know cleaning up the streets and um, so this committee formed and um, there was an understanding and then there was a kind of an argument between the, the pro bike lane and the anti bike lane people the kind of the macho cyclists that say I don't need a bike lane and the and then the other people who want them and so there were all these things going on but um, I think nobody had ever really reached out to say how do you it was the same kind of deal that I'm talking about tonight it's like how do you gather the ecosystem and so it, it had been kind of um, granola bicycle advocacy, like all the people that are um, advocates, NGOs, but not, not business people, people weren't right. But then what happened was um, a whole bunch of different factors, but business people started having you know midlife crisis instead of getting the red sports car they would get the fancy new bike and we began to um, um, actually one of the things I was hired to do was to develop a network of bicycle user groups and this was really effective and boy it would have been really a lot easier with internet I can't even tell you I mean and I know I sound like oh, I was young I walked two, uh, two year, hours to, to school but you know, we, we actually went to all the companies and all the building managers and said, can you put more bikes in, bike parking in there? And that was like a lot of work for us. So then we decided to, to talk to somebody in each building who would be 
the head of the bike user group. And then they would help those people in that building know how to fix their bike or get a new bike. They would ride in with them. They would have meetings. And then we had this newsletter called, and, and they were bugs. They were called bugs because bicycle user groups. So we had a newsletter um, that went to all the bugs. So we had 200 bugs in Toronto. And they were from big companies to small companies to NGOs across the city. And then we had this newsletter called The Buggle, where we profiled um, really cool things. Like the guy in Noranda, um, you know, it's, it's really important to have the showers and the bike parking. It seems really simple, but um, uh, if people can't shower when they get to work. So this Noranda, person at Noranda had put the showers instead of in the really dank place up on the 50 something floor and it was like all marble, <laughs> really beautiful. And so we would profile stuff like that about how people got their building managers to do things like that. They, and then we had, um, we had um, bike, started out to be bike to work day. And then it went to bike to work week. And now it's bike month. And um, again, it was a distributed system. So, and it was actually the way, the reason why that happened was because I'm lazy. And I figured, you know, organizing an event per day is just too much work. Let's see if people can do this. So um, we talked to um, restaurants or, or, or bars or uh, building owners, whatever. Can you host a breakfast? So um, for example, um, the CEO of CIBC was out flipping pancakes at one of the breakfasts um, right out in front of the big, tall CIBC building. And they, you know, they're interested in cycling for different reasons, but if you get that community going, you have, and so anyway, I guess the third bike week in, we had 80 events. And I think we organized one. And um, no, we organized maybe three, but tons of stuff going on. And then um, we also had a bike art auction. So we collect, for, for 10 years actually, we collected bicycles from people's garages, donated bicycles, gave them to local artists. They made them into works of art. We auctioned them off um, at a really beautiful space and used the money to give to um, Bikes Not Bombs and you know, give bikes to you know, Nicaragua, Mozambique, and Haiti. That was back in the 80s. Anyway, things like that. And, and started a bike choir. Um, and, and through these things, and we had uh, bike salons. So every, um, every month, there would be um, at a bar, um, a different bar, um, a place where people just go and hang out. And all these ideas came up there because you'd have the people, you have the, the midlife crisis people there talking to the bike couriers, talking to, you know, everybody, and they come up with really cool things. So if, you've, if you build a culture that way, then, and let it be flat, don't, don't have it necessarily be so hierarchical, you're generating all this wonderful energy. That's just some thoughts. Oh, well, it's still going. I mean, and, and I, think, I think a bunch of stuff happened in the first three or four years. Because it was, but the thing was, I mean, the, the difference is that the city of Toronto paid salaries. They paid me a salary to do that. Um, now, mind you, I mean, my budget the first year was $10,000. And that was to do Bike Week, right? And that was including all of the flyers and everything like that. But people, we, we were able to lever stuff. So it was like thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars worth. So you can start with things where you have a really bunch of great events. You get popular people. We, had, we always had a thing where Jack Layton would ride the bike, somebody else would uh, take the transit, and somebody else would drive their car, see who got in first. They did this in Brazil last, I guess, a few months ago. 
and they had somebody helicoptering because you know how they helicopter in Brazil? So they added that in there. <laughs> but anyway, so you can do tons of stuff. I'm happy to talk to you about it afterwards because it's, not, it's also not rocket science and it's incredibly fun. It's incredibly fun. The culture part is essential and people see it as soft. But you know, Toronto won best city for cycling in North America, and one of the things that they cited, I know, shocking, that was back in 95 when no cities were great in North America for cycling. But, but the reason why, one of the reasons was because of the, the bike culture stuff that hadn't really been done much in other places. I'm going to suggest that maybe you should have some dinner. Um, because I don't know how many other people in the room have eaten, but uh, Susan hasn't. <laughs> so I, I actually think that this was extraordinary and, and also this message about what the field of design is in a world of complex and systems mobility where it isn't a single idea and it isn't a, t a, a, a kind of grand concept that comes down from above, but it's a concept that is developed and then shared and worked from top and bottom and middle and everywhere else at the same time. And I've never heard anyone champion it so genuinely, so elegantly and so emotionally. So uh, Susan, thank you for coming here tonight and, and uh, welcome to the region of Waterloo. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.